uh, this event is one that traditionally had been for donors of a certain level, but as we did last summer, uh, we're very pleased to be offering it to everyone this time. The way it works is simple. Usually our education manager, Norma Erickson and I each select something cool from the collection, something that you don't usually get to see on a regular tour. And those are on display for viewing and for guessing at their purpose before the program. Then we each spend some time explaining what they are, how they came to be and why we love them. With the virtual format, things are a little different, but it is still a good time. And today, to spice things up a little, we have a very special guest speaker, Dr. William McNeese, who you might recognize as uh, something of a regular at the Indiana Medical History Museum. If you do enjoy the program, we hope that you'll help us to provide more like this in the future by making a donation on our website. Uh, one more time, imhm.org. It's always so important to have support from folks like you, but right now it's really pretty critical. So if you're a donor, thank you. If you're not, thank you also, and we hope you'll consider becoming one. So here we go. Norma Erickson is a graduate of IUPUI with bachelor degrees in religious studies and general studies with a concentration in math and science and a master of arts in US history. Her thesis focused on African American healthcare in Indianapolis at the turn of the 20th century. Previously, she worked as an analyst in clinical forensics, criminal justice, and athletic drug testing laboratories. But more recently, she was the managing editor, editor of the IJHAC, a journal of humanities and arts computing. And she was the assistant managing editor of the forthcoming digital version of the Encyclopedia of Indianapolis uh, through the Polis Center at IUPUI. As a volunteer at the museum, she began giving tours of the old pathology building way back in 2004 and is now, we're happy to say, employed here as the IMHM education manager. So Norma, take it away. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, we have a real special gadget tonight. Which you're going to see. Can I help you with something, Norma? I think I just turned myself completely off. I can see no, you. Here I am. Here I am. <laughs> here I am. I'm back. Welcome back. Thank you. Ha ha ha. I'm gonna take my glasses off. It's hard to see. So this particular uh, artifact, I have the uh, museum studies intern this year to thank for spotting it under the amphitheater in storage and says, what's that? So I don't know. So uh, we found out. We're going to call it a gizmo because it's a gadget. Gadget is a small mechanical electronic device or tool. And this is indeed ingenious. So here it is. Pretty. Session number 89.15.2. And on it is inscribed C. Reichert, Bean, number 177. Here's another view. Oh, and there, okay, that's looking right down on top of it. So you see there's this tube uh, that perhaps you could put something in. And here you see the inscription of the manufacturer and also some gradations. So they're gonna be doing some measuring with this thing. So we find out that this is a polariscope 
made by C. Riker Company, which Bean is actually Vienna. And it was a, a company that made a lot of optical equipment and was eventually bought by American Monitor. This particular artifact came from the Department of Biochemistry at the IU School of Medicine. And it was actually in the department in use by somebody in 1941 when Donald Bowman, PhD, came in and took over the, the department. Uh, so whether he used this scope or not, don't know, but it was certainly was in the department uh, when he was doing his research. A polariscope allows you to see polarized light, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But the Donald Bowman, I need to go back and say that uh, he discovered a very important um, protease inhibitor. The bowman burke protease inhibitor is in soybeans, and it has uh, protective qualities, uh, anti-cancer uh, qualities, and some protective heart qualities, and he discovered that. Um, and you'll have to read about that. There's a new book out that is the history of the IU School of Medicine, and there's a section in there that talks about him. And apparently Dr. Gatch, who was the dean of the, of the medical school, when Bowman came on, the burning question he wanted answered was, why do beans cause flatulence? So one thing led to another, and now we have the bowman burke protease inhibitor is uh, something that we know about. So a polariscope allows you to see polarized light. What's polarized light? Well, when you turn on a light bulb, light goes everywhere from that source. Uh, it travels like a ray of light. But if we think of each of those rays as they're, as they're radiating from the source as being almost like a piece of paper, a plane, a plane. OK, so instead of looking at all the light, we just want to look at that one, one part of that light. And when they're able to isolate that, which you can do, and you isolate just that one plane of light, then we can use that to tell uh, and use many things. So that's what a polariscope is for. In this case, it was a saccharimeter, so it was manufactured to look at sugars. And people have been looking at it for a long time. The prism that is in this instrument was actually first invented by William Nicol. He was a Scottish geologist. Uh, he was a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. And in 1828, he developed a prism that would allow light to be polarized. And he did it by using the crystal that you see as Icelandic spar. Uh, and he cut, cut it in planes and put them together, glued them with Canadian balsam, which is tree sap, thank you, Canada. And when you do that, you're actually able to cause polarization. So the light comes in, the light source comes in on one end, and this crystal has the ability to cause a double refraction. You can actually see two images through this. So these two rays of light, when it hits the glue, the Canada balsam, one ray goes off one way and the other way, ray goes the other. And then you can, that one that goes out the other end, that's the one you're gonna to use to do whatever measurements or detection or whatever you're gonna use for that. So uh, that was uh, 1848. But even before that, way long before that, polarized light might have been used by other people. Oh, and this is the actual view of our instrument. Uh, I took off the part where the red arrow is, unscrewed that, and there's your uh, nickel prism for this particular instrument. These guys, it is theorized. There is no actual proof. It's only a, a, a passed down saga that the Vikings had a sunstone, they called it a sunstone, that on days when it was stormy, uh, or even in the Scandinavian uh, area, you know, the twilight is really long and you don't have the sun in order to navigate, 
the Vikings were great navigators. Uh, what are you going to do if you can't see the sun? Uh, and apparently they had a stone that they could look up in the sky and find the sun behind clouds. And that's entirely, entirely possible because the light from the sun is polarized by our atmosphere in rings. And when you hold one of these pieces of Icelandic spar up to the sky, when you finally find where the sun is, there's a flash of yellow. So this was talked about in this saga that was written down in the 1200s. And even if you go back to the, I think it was the very, very first episode of Vikings on the History Channel, uh, this fellow gave Ragnar Rothbrook a, a special stone that he would able be able to navigate and find the sun wherever it was. But really in history, it really wasn't written about until this fellow, Erasmus Bartholin, he was the doctor for the King of Denmark, and somebody gave him a piece of this crystal. And he noticed that when he looked through it, he saw two images. So that was uh, exciting. And he wrote a whole book about it, or maybe it wasn't a big book, but he wrote about it. And this is the book he wrote about in 1669. So that was our first actual historical uh, evidence of the ability of this crystal, which is uh, calcium carbonate, to polarize light. But in the late 70s, somebody discovered a shipwreck, which they know the ship went down in 1592 in the English Channel. And when the marine archaeologists have been uh, looking at that boat, they found out that there was a big chunk of this Icelandic spar in the debris. So perhaps these uh, sailors were using that to help navigate. And then uh, in 1809, uh, this fellow, and I didn't take French, but I'm going to say Etienne Louis Malus, uh, was the first person who actually used the term polarization of light. And he had it that light was, he defined them as corpuscles that lined up, and that's what uh, polarized the light. Okay, so we have this uh, wonderful scientific, uh, physical, chemical, physical uh, phenomenon that is happening with this crystal. Well, what do we do with it? One thing that was discovered, besides having this double refraction and being able to find this ray to show, shine through this crystal, was that if you put certain chemicals in the path, that light at, at the other end came out either bent to the right or bent to the left. It didn't go straight through that. Remember the tube that we saw looking down the tube? You put something in that and shine this polarized light through it. If the chemical in there, the molecules in there are, have this ability called uh, optical, uh, they, uh, it turns it to the left or the right. So some molecules are mirror images of each other. And if it's a D molecule, dextro goes to the right and L goes to the left. And so this is an example, mirror image, Samuel L. Jackson, Samuel D. Jackson. So these are optical reactive. So let's move forward to today and polarized light still plays a very, very big role in laboratories and clinical laboratories and other kinds of laboratories. Uh, but microscopes use polarized light and there are uh, fluorescent, fluorescent polarization assays that are used in laboratories to measure things. So it's a very useful piece of, equi piece of equipment and an idea. And don't we all wish we had a tricorder to scan people and know exactly what's wrong with them? Uh, well, this is something I just found. This was just published in 
2020 of someone is proposing non-invasive glucose monitoring using polarized light, shine it at the palm of the hand, and they'll be able to tell uh, what the level of a person's glucose is very, uh, very close to what is considered a very accurate amount. Uh, Non-invasive glucose monitoring has been like a holy grail for as long as I can remember in labs. It's anytime not being able, having to draw blood to, to know what's in the blood uh, is one thing. So this would be a use if these people ever get it worked up of polarized light. Oh, this is somebody using one. This Now this is from the 1940s. This is from a 1940 catalog. So when we look at the one we have, uh, the the person who has sessioned it thought it was about 1930 but uh yeah maybe even before 1930 is what ours is this is the saccharimeter that's what i got and yeah thank you to david zoner who took the photographs and michael rice is our museum studies intern who found it and I learned a lot. Plus, I got to think about Vikings. That's all. <laughs> I'm going to stop sharing and turn off my video and mute. And so you're talking with me. Thank you, Norma. That was pretty great. Um, as a reminder, we'll hold off questions until after both presentations are done, but do uh, keep them coming in the chat. And if you would post them where everyone can see them, that would be helpful. So next, I'm going to introduce our special guest speaker, Dr. William McNeese. He's a longtime resident of Indianapolis and a member of the Marion County Historical Society. He's also a graduate of Indiana University School of Medicine. He's a physician who teaches and practices pediatric anesthesiology, and he's a longtime member of the Institutional Infection Prevention Committee. So welcome back, Dr. McNeese. Well, thank you. Are, uh, are you hearing me and are you seeing a slide that says the Goodell obstetric anesthesia machine? I see your face, but I do hear you. <laughs> okay, so you're not seeing a slide just yet. I am not. Let me work on that for a minute. Uh, let me see here. So share screen. about now? Perfect. Okay. Well, hello all. Um, and we will proceed on to talk about uh, another device that uh, is in the uh, Indiana Medical History Museum's collections and it's the Goodell Obstetrical Anesthetic Machine is the way that it's described. And so, Click here. Okay, so this is the uh, the case of the of the device that we're talking about today. And if we open it up, uh, we'll see there's uh, two sides to it. And then if we take out the pieces that are on the inside of it, uh, it looks something like this. So on the top half of this is a nitrous oxide tank. Uh, so this is a tank with nitrous oxide in it. It's been filled uh, commercially or it was somewhere along the line. And then uh, there is a, a valve at the top that this uh, handle can be used to open and close. Uh, and then the nitrous oxide comes out of this portion of it. And in use, uh, this connection here would be uh, put over here. Uh, this screw would be used to tighten it down together. And so that allows nitrous oxide released from the tank by this handle to flow into this device here. Now, I think that we would say that the device is not in great condition. Uh, we can see where it's um, uh, been damaged here. And this, which was presumably originally rubber is uh, now very, uh, very much fixed in its position. Uh, but that this is the device. And we can see there's some stuff written on the side of it here. And if you look at that, it says the 
William H. Armstrong Company Makers in Indianapolis, Indiana. And then on the other side, it says Dr. Goodell's patent, uh, 112612. So that's uh, kind of an overview of the device that we're talking about. So let's see what else we can learn about uh, both Dr. Goodell, uh, a little bit on Mr. Armstrong and uh, on the device. So this is, the, this is a close up of that. And then let's explore that more. So this is an image of Dr. Goodell, Dr. Arthur Ernest Goodell. It's an image from his 1906 medical school class photo. Goodell um, comes from originally, uh, his father was born in Switzerland, comes to the United States. His mother is of German heritage. Uh, she uh, is born in Pennsylvania. They get together in some, some method, I don't know, but they end up here in the 1880 census uh, in Blackford County where um, John Goodell, uh, Arthur's father, is listed as a farmer. That's in 1880, but by 1883, they have found the way to Cambridge City here. And we know that because Arthur Goodell was born here in 1883. Uh, so Cambridge City, Indianapolis here, Cambridge, and so the family comes down here. So we know in uh, 1883, the family is here in Cambridge City. By 1891, there's a note in the Cambridge City Tribune that John Goodell has moved his family to Indianapolis, where he's engaged in the Atkins Sawworks, now manufacturing the patent patent needlepoint saw, the invention of Mr. Goodell. So 1891, Arthur would have been about eight years old at this time. So the E.C. Atkins and Company uh, Sawworks is a, is a big company. Um, we can see an image of it here uh, from uh, about 1907. Uh, this is South Street here. This is Merrill Street down here. This is Capitol Avenue here. And on the other side of the building, so over here somewhere is Illinois Street. And if you think of downtown Indianapolis today where the main post office is, you got a parking lot here. This is the post office here. This is where there's a bunch of uh, mail trucks that go in and out. So today's downtown main Indianapolis post office sits on this location where a century before, um, the E.C. Atkins and Company saw manufacturers uh, had a major plant and employed lots of people. If we look at this uh, photo or this map of downtown Indianapolis, this would be the, uh, the company site here. And what we have here uh, with these blue squares are locations where uh, the Goodell family lived uh, in the 1890s. They moved around some, but um, for this period of time, uh, they were always uh, within walking distance of the Atkins saw plant here. If you look at the 1900 census and look for the Goodell family, uh, they're living uh, um, in that Southern blue square area down, down in here. And we can see noted that John Goodell, the head of the household is a saw filer, uh, as are his two older sons, William F and Arthur E. And so at age 16, Arthur Goodell was working uh, as a saw filer uh, at the Atkins saw plant. So that's uh, 1900. If we look at uh, 1904, so a few years later, Arthur has moved out to do some other things and he is serving as the physical director for the Boys Club um, on the south side of Indianapolis. That's 1904. 1905, he's moved on and has become a student. And we're trying to figure out where he's a student and that turns out to be uh, probably Indiana University. Uh, so this is from the Indiana University yearbook of 1906. They're not identified uh, specifically by name, but I'm pretty confident this is Arthur Goodell here in the middle of this group of the Indiana Club 
at Indiana University in 1906. He then moves and becomes a student at the Indiana Medical College. And this is an image uh, of that college in downtown Indianapolis. And he is a member of the senior class here, the 1908 graduating class of the Indiana Medical College, the School of Medicine of Purdue University. And this is Goodell's image here, the one that I showed you earlier. Uh, he does some other things at the same time. So this is also 1906. And there's mention that Butler College has secured the services of Arthur Goodell to coach your basketball team. Uh, makes mention he's a competent coach, uh, has worked on this. He was at Indiana University last year, played on their freshman football team there. Uh, for three years, he's had the boys club and he has always been very successful, uh, had that winning team and congratulations to Butler. Well, his record coaching Butler, of course he was going to medical school at the time, same time it seems, uh, wasn't real great. Uh, the Butler pretty much stopped the Purdue Medical School here, uh, but other than um, uh, eking out a win over Indiana State Normal, uh, it was a losing season th that year. As part of his classes, uh, sometime during his first or second year, he would have uh, taken a, a, a more series of, uh, of classes on nervous diseases taught at what was described as the insane hospital. So I'm pretty sure uh, that Goodell was sitting in the amphitheater at times there uh, where the Medical History Museum is located now. There's mention of him uh, in the Purdue yearbook of 1908 that uh, Giedel was born as we knew in Cambridge City, a physical director, great singer, uh, mourns the absence of a piano. So uh, this is Arthur Goodell. And he graduates then in 1906. He uh, says here, the senior class, the School of Medicine at Purdue University. Uh, you may have noticed this uh, image on, on the side of uh, uh, the, the amphitheater room uh, at the Medical History Museum. And so Goodell goes to school right, oops, sorry in this period of time here. And so right here is where he graduates. And so while he does his medical college work at the Indiana Medical College School of Medicine or Purdue University, he actually graduates from Indiana University uh, right here uh, and their medical school in uh, 1908. So 1908, he goes on, um, he becomes an intern at the city hospital, uh, works there for a period of time, and at some point becomes interested in anesthesia. So this is 1908, uh, 1912 uh, reports, uh, and he sets up a general practice in 1912, his office is uh, on Prospect Street. 1914, it's in the Newton Claypool building. And it notes specifically his office hours of one to three uh, devoted to anesthesia in some manner here. This is an image uh, here of the, um, uh, I can't remember the name of it. The Newton Claypool building is here on the end. Uh, this is the Hugh Manser building here. Board of Trade building here. So this is uh, Ohio Street here. Uh, L, uh, Pennsylvania would be over here, Meridian back here somewhere. So we're looking kind of Southeast. And so these were uh, important complexes of uh, physicians practicing here um, in the early part of the 20th century. This is a, uh, the Indianapolis Medical Journal, it's um, an issue published in October 15th of 1911. Um, I will note that it's comments here that it's an independent medical journal. The editor assumes no responsibility for the views of the contributors. So I, I can't talk about quality, quality here, but uh, this is um, the Indianapolis Medical Journal. And within this issue is, um, uh, an article published called Nitrous Oxide Air Anesthesia, Self-Administered in Obstetrics, a Preliminary Report. 
It's by Arthur Goodell, uh, and it uh, reports on uh, something that he presented on October uh, the 3rd of 1911. And if we look at that in greater detail, this is what he comments here. Um, the physician has uh, only in recent years seriously considered the application of nitrous oxide. It had really been around for a long time, uh, but used um, in dentistry uh, significantly, which is its initial uses. But he's talking here about its use in obstetrics, and he thinks it has great promise. Uh, within the article on the next page is this drawing, and we can see here that we've got a tank here of nitrous oxide uh, hooked up to a linkage here. This is a, um, a, a gas bag, a, a bag that can uh, inflate and deflate here, and then uh, the nitrous oxide through a uh, respiratory air valve here and a valve here can be delivered to a mask uh, and inhaled by, uh, by a patient. And he summarizes it that it's uh, sufficient that nitrous oxide gas when administered in varying quantities of air as the particular condition may require, the inhaler being held either by an attendant or the patient and preferably the latter, provides a convenient, safe, certain, harmless and economic means of relieving the suffering of women in labor without producing any undesirable after effects whatsoever. I think this is a pretty optimistic view uh, of what it could actually do, but that's the way that it was described. Um, so he presents the article, um, he, sorry, he applies for the application for a patent here, September the 12th, 1911. He delivers that uh, paper on October the 3rd, and then he receives the patent on, uh, not, on November the 26th of 1912. And I'll just rotate this around for us to be able to see a little bit better. So this is a, uh, the, the patent drawing here. Um, he's added a little bit to it. So there's this uh, tube that goes down to the bottom of the, of the bag here. And he's got some greater detail uh, of this uh, control uh, air blending valve that he has described here. So on uh, November the 26th, 1912, is the, the patent date for this device. This is a, a page taken from uh, the book Anesthesia. It's one of the very early texts on anesthesia uh, being written by James Taylor Guathme. And uh, within it here is a, a diagram or an image of Goodell's apparatus for the self-administration of nitrous oxide, sometimes spelled with an E and sometimes not, and air and describing it. And we can see this is uh, an image of the item that uh, is in the uh, Medical History Museum collection and the, the flexible breathing bag that, uh, flexible gas bag that we would uh, normally have seen there for the device in use. 1915, the American Yearbook of Anesthesia and Analgesia published by Francis McMeekin. Uh, and this uh, issue from 1915 uh, includes an article uh, by Arthur Goodell of Indianapolis, Indiana, uh, talking about the use of nitrous oxide in obstetrics. It's got uh, another image of the uh, Goodell apparatus for uh, self-administration of analgesia in obstetrics. And it also has an image here of a perturient um, here with uh, um, two uh, individuals. And if we focus in on this portion of it, uh, we can see this is the, an image of Goodell's <clears throat> uh, apparatus, uh, this valve being controlled uh, by an attendant of some sort here, and then the nitrous oxide air being delivered uh, to this uh, woman in labor. And she is holding the the handle of the device and applying the, the mask that she is breathing from. So this is from an image from 1915. So that is a, a kind of a description of uh, how this came to be and what it looks like. 
and, uh, and how it was used uh, in use in 1915. And it continues uh, now for, this is an, an item that you know, perhaps is a uh, hundred years old or more now. We don't have our precise date. Well, let's talk a little bit more about Arthur Goodell. Uh, he goes on, um, continues uh, in Indianapolis. In World War I, he uh, enters the military. Uh, he's, he becomes uh, known as the motor, motorcycle anesthetist um, because he is uh, charged with being responsible for uh, the anesthetics being delivered in a variety of stations and notably uh, develops and promotes a chart that he uses to teach the administration of ether anesthesia by looking at breathing patterns and heart rates and eye signs. He returns to Indianapolis after World War I. Uh, he moves down, the, down Ohio Street, uh, sets up offices in the Humanser building uh, where he has office hours. Uh, you know, there's nothing in the morning, so perhaps he is uh, practicing at various, um, various hospitals. And in 1925, is noted as being a, an anesthesiologist or uh, delivering anesthesia at St. Vincent's Hospital. His last date in Indianapolis is in 1928, where he is noted to be a, a member of the City Board of Health, uh, lives up uh, on uh, Carrollton Avenue, and sometime later that year, uh, then moves to Beverly Hills, California. He there continues his research, writing clinical practice. He becomes a clinical professor of anesthesia at the University of Southern California, uh, publishes a text uh, uh, titled Inhalational Anesthesia in 1937, and then retires uh, due to problems with health in 1940. Uh, he returns regularly to Indiana. Uh, he is involved uh, as a, uh, in visiting and attending um, educational programs the Department of uh, Anesthesiology uh, Educational Program at Indiana University, and then dies just short of his 73rd birthday in 1956. So that is uh, one of uh, three people connected to this apparatus. That's Arthur Goodell, the inventor of this uh, obstetrical anesthesia machine here. Let's move on then to look at the manufacturer uh, William H. Armstrong and Company, and that's stamped here um, on the uh, part of the device here. And this is an image of the William H. Armstrong and Company uh, building. Uh, the image is from about 1898, and we can see here it's the William Armstrong and Company building. Uh, surgical instruments, crutches, trusses, batteries, rubber goods, hosiery, a whole range of different things here. And it's located on the Northeast corner of Illinois and Maryland streets. So this is 1898. And if we look in the 1912 uh, city directory uh, from the date of the patent for the uh, Goodell device, we can see that the Armstrong, William H. Armstrong Company uh, is so it's located at the same place uh, here on West Maryland Street um, at, at Illinois. And if we look at the name right above that, that's William H. Armstrong, the president of the William H. Armstrong Company. So William H. Armstrong from his obituary from 1912, uh, born in England, comes to Knox County, Illinois as a, uh, as a young person. Um, you know, with his parents. He serves in the Union Army and um, then serves as a period of time as the mayor of Terre Haute, Indiana in the 1880s, establishes the William H. Armstrong Company, comes to Indianapolis uh, and uh, has this business uh, as we saw from that image earlier. Additionally, he served as the senior vice commander of the Grand Army of the Republic and as president of the Board of Trustees of Indiana State Normal School. The company continues in business uh, into the 1920s. We can see their promotional material here, uh, the Surgical Instrument House, 
Um, they've moved then to Ohio Street and moved again, the surgical instrument house. Um, and they, uh, they celebrate at least their 50th year in business uh, at this location uh, in the 1930s. Well, from there, um, let's move on to look at the third person who's involved in, in this artifact, and that's E.E. E. Hodgen, Everett E. Hodgen. Um, born in Westfield, Indiana, went to a couple of medical schools, uh, practiced in Indiana, and according to the records of the, of the donor, uh, Hodgen uh, purchased the Goodell obstetric anesthe anesthetic machine, obstetrical anesthetic machine, uh, as a new product. This is uh, his obituary from uh, December the 5th, uh, 1923. And he's apparently a pretty impressive person in Indianapolis. He is, he is on page one. Uh, he is above the fold. Uh, so this was pretty big news of the death of Dr. Hodgen here. And if we look at this, uh, talks about uh, what was going on with him, gives a nice biography of him. And then if we look down in this corner of it, and I'll blow it up here, we can see that uh, he's described as a diamond in the rough. That's what he was uh, by Dr. A.E. Arthur E. Goodell, also a member of the health board, and goes on to describe them. So very clearly, uh, Goodell and um, uh, Hodgen uh, knew each other uh, fairly well. Uh, so it's not surprising that uh, Hodgen might have purchased Goodell's uh, obstetrical anesthesia machine. And we should also know that um, Hodgen uh, did have an obstetrical practice and the records at the um, Indiana Historical Society uh, include uh, uh, a listing of him of his obstetrical patients uh, during his uh, period of practice there. So those are the three individuals that are connected with this uh, gadget or gizmo here, I think probably a gadget. Uh, the inventor, Arthur Goodell, the manufacturer, the William H. Armstrong Company and its founder, William Armstrong, and the original owner of the uh, device, E.E. Uh, e. Hodgen. And with that, we can put it back in its box and close its lid. And that's uh, it for the uh, Goodell obstetrical anesthesia uh, machine, anesthetic machine. And... Thank you, Dr. You. McNeese. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we do have a couple of questions. Norma, do you wanna come back to us? And I will stop sharing here. I'm coming back. <laughs> Welcome <laughs> back to both of you. Um, we have just a couple of questions. Um, all but one are anonymous questions. So uh, for Norma, uh, what are some other applications of the polarized light? Uh, well, two things that I found that I didn't uh, certainly did. Bees, beekeeping, honey makers use it because of the sugars that are you that are made, the bee makes in honey, uh, it, I think is D. And uh, if pe people can make artificial honey, and that's L. So if someone's uh, evaluating a honey as to whether it's a naturally made honey or not, they use that. And then mostly it gets used in geomology, uh, looking at stones and finding out whether they're artificial or natural gems. That's two ways that it gets used a lot. Um, Dr. McNeese, uh, Ron wondered whether John Goodell, who was born October 9th of 1913 in Portland, Indiana, was maybe related to the Goodells in Indy, if you happen to know. Uh, apparently, John Goodell was a producer and writer who was known for his work on the Groucho Marx show. <laughs> Um, and I would love to know too. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, I guess I would love to know too, and I don't. Um, you know, certainly the that family is from there. Uh, Arthur Goodell has um, two daughters, um, and they have um, 
some of his descendants are in the northwestern part of the United States. I can't remember if it is Washington State or Oregon. Uh, he certainly had uh, several other uh, siblings um, and maybe there's a relation there. I wouldn't be surprised if they're related, but I don't know that much of uh, uh, the producer writer of the Groucho Mark show, but I should learn more about that. Sounds like something worth digging into, I think. Yes, yes that, that's an opportunity. <laughs> uh, Norma, um, someone, and I, I think a lot of us would like to know the glucose monitoring. When is, like, how far is that from being commercially, oh. commercially available? <laughs> yeah, this was just is a it a pipe that, dream? Uh, that was just a concept article. I, I don't oh. know how close they would be. They were just uh, had figured out that what they were the results they were getting were very close to what a, a, a traditional glucose monitor would uh, would give. And <laughs> so yeah, we'll just see. I think it's great. <laughs> the whole thing. <laughs> Dr. McNeese, I have another one for you. Um, were inventions like this one lucrative for physicians and scientists? Um, I, don't, I don't know for sure the answer to that. What I can say is that uh, it was very common to have a number of different variations of machines that were not a lot different, um, but it did have different different individuals' names on it. Uh, so um, there is, uh, um, for example, some anesthesia machines and there's the, the Texas model and the Long Island model and the two or three other models. They're not a lot different one from the other, but you know that, that was a title that, that you could have there. Um, but I, I don't know uh, where where dollars um, did or didn't flow related to that. Uh, and then we have one last one for you, Dr. McNeese. Uh, Bruce would like to know if you could talk briefly about why nitrous is not sufficient for labor and delivery. I can, but I don't know if it'll be brief, but here goes. <laughs> Give it a shot. <laughs> so nitrous oxide, it, has is a relatively um, has some good analgesic effects, so pain relieving effects. Its downside is that it is not a very potent agent, and so if you want to have an anesthetic depth that is effective for let's say half the population you really need to have 100% nitrous oxide if you're working in a standard atmosphere. So that was the big disadvantage to it. It didn't smell bad, that was nice. It didn't blow up, that was nice. Uh, but it just wasn't as potent as you would like it to be. Uh, so there were demonstrations um, in France um, that if you would, in effect, take a patient and put the patient in a in a giant tank and increase the pressure around the patient. So instead of working at one atmosphere, you were working at, I think it was about 1.25 or 1.3 atmospheres. Then you could get um, enough anesthesia by just breathing nitrous oxide in and out, but that wasn't a very practical solution. It was used fairly frequently uh, in dentistry because you didn't need a very long anesthetic to pull some teeth. Uh, so it was used pretty extensively there. Uh, it was used some um, for uh, analgesia and you know, it, it, it can be used for a labor analgesic. Uh, but if you're gonna do that, you really do need to blend some oxygen with it and not just air, otherwise you're delivering uh, an epoxic mission mixture to your patients. So that was a, a big downside of this. Um, and then the other downside to it is that if you would look at it uh, today, uh, then you've got the, the problem of the nitrous oxide 
how do you scavenge that? How do you keep it out in the general environment for everyone else around you? So maybe not too brief, but uh, that was at least something about the, the use of nitrous oxide as, as an analgesic, uh, where it, it you know, had some advantage there. It's uh, an agent that continues to be available with some limited use by anesthesiologists today. Um, but it, uh, it doesn't have anywhere near the use that it would have had, um, let's say, 40 years ago. And then was anesthesiology uh, common oh, you got it. <laughs> at this time, or was it ahead of its time? Uh, well, it kind of goes back to Queen Victoria uh, and the delivery of her, I can't remember, next to last child, was that number six or somewhere? I can't remember how many she had. <laughs> um, but um, ether and chloroform, um, she, she said, a, Gosh, I like this. This is this is good. So it it was out there, and um, it was used at at least uh, back into the eighteen uh, forties. So it it was known, um, but it was not. I don't know how commonly it, it was used. But but clearly, Dr. Goodell thought there was a. Uh, a good potential use for it uh, for his, for obstetric patients in his practice. Well, thank you both very much. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, we do have a program coming up that I wanna mention on Wednesday, February 10th. We're partnering with the Ray Bradbury Center at IUPUI for a program called Getting to the Heart of It. And you can find more information about that or reserve your spot on our website, imhm.org slash events. So um, thank you and have a, a great evening. Thank you. Bye all.